There's no lack of hybrids in the Alien universe, but a personal favorite of ours is the Alien Terminator hybrid that appeared in the four-issue comic titled Alien vs. Predator vs. the Terminator, released in 2000. Not only did the comic connect the three franchises in an exceptional manner, but it also gave an army of hybrid super soldiers that seem worthy of taking on the Predators and the Aliens. In this video, we will explore this amazing comic and dive deep into the origin, powers, and motives of the cunning and powerful Alien Terminator hybrids. Let's begin, shall we? Before we go into our explanation, we have a very small request. If you like our content, please support us by subscribing to our channel. This is a small click for you, but for us, it means a lot. Thank you. Let's begin. The Mission This fascinating story begins with a group of mercenaries arriving in the midst of a sewer-residing community, but nothing else is known about the location. They finally find who they were looking for, and the shorter one of them exclaims the name synonymous with the Alien franchise. It was Ellen Ripley. She seemed to be in a terrible state in ragged clothes, unwashed for weeks, and frail. In fact, she asked one of them to help her stand up, but the mercenary did not oblige because she was far from how she looked. One of the others came for his comrade's help, but met quite the same fate as this discreet woman in rags beat the crap out of two skilled fighters. Ripley would have left the men in far worse condition, but she was interrupted by Anna Lee Cow, who identified herself to Ripley. Quite obviously, the Ellen Ripley here was Ripley 8, the clone that was resurrected in Alien Resurrection, and Anna Lee Cow was the synthetic who helped Ripley fight the Xenomorphs and the newborn. The movie ended with Ripley and Anna Lee talking about how they would stick together while on Earth, but it seems that Ripley had failed to keep her word. Cal takes Ripley to the former's base of operations so that they can talk in a place that isn't somewhere where sewage went to die. In their conversations with Cal, Ripley expresses her hatred towards the scientists who did what they did to her. I can't even die properly. They don't even know what species I am. But you can bet your plastic ass they'd love to find me and prod me and cut me until they find an answer. So, for those of us who don't remember, Ripley 8 had been impregnated before the events of Alien Resurrection, and in the movie, they managed to retrieve her DNA and create a clone that would simply be called Ripley 8. This clone's DNA was a splice between xenomorph and human DNA, which gave her heightened senses and physical abilities. Anyway, Ripley asks Annalie Cal the reason why she was there, to which Cal replied, they are at it again, the military. The extra biological project boys are at it again. Cal explains that her moles had uncovered a bioengineering project on Circle 7, which was so deep that even Cal's team had managed to obtain little to no details about it. All that she knew for sure was that the hybrid super soldier project was being led by someone named Trollenberg, and that the project had something to do with harvesting the DNA of Linguifueda acaronsis which was the scientific name for xenomorphs. The next panel takes us to the lab of the said Dr. Trollenberg, where he was in fact operating on someone obnoxiously huge for a human. Trollenberg could be seen holding, with his bloodied hands, a canister filled with some kind of a serum, while speaking to another scientist named Fennec. He's informed about the arrival of General Helms, which Trollenberg said he would handle. The conversation between the two of them throws a light of light on what was happening on the Typhoon. So, Trollenberg was working with Cybernet on his alien genetic research, which General Helm knew was unusual, as well as miles away from the previously approved plan. Furthermore, he was commissioning components from unauthorized sources. The furious general tells Trollenberg that he intends to shut the project down, but Trollenberg was too close to his success and wouldn't have some military commander tell him what to do. Trollenberg opens fire on Helm and his guards, killing them all. To ensure that no one came looking for the recently deceased, Trollenberg changes his voice to match Helm's, and tells tells the bridge, this is General Helm, alerting the bridge. I'll be remaining with Dr. Trollenberg through the completion of the project. I can be contacted here. Following this, he throws the bodies into a vat of acid. So who or what was Dr. Trollenberg? We'll soon find out. The scene shifts back to Alan Lee Cal, her colleagues, and Ripley 8, where Cal tells her that her team had obtained the schematics of the Typhoon systems, crew rosters, operating schedules, etc. And yet, Cal needed Ripley. Why was that? Well, Cal was unaware of the alien hybrid super soldier that she would be dealing with aboard the Typhoon. Furthermore, the same cloning tech that had resurrected Ripley was being used here. Ripley was a hybrid herself, and therefore she had superhuman strength and abilities. But Ripley wasn't interested in saving humanity by stopping the project. 
I know enough to know that it can't be stopped. The aliens are coming and the human race will suffer. They do what they have to do, and then you're dead, and it's over. However, it wasn't just despair that Ripley was feeling. She was probably afraid that the military would once again use her as a lab rat. They wouldn't let her live in peace, nor would they let her rest in peace. However, Annalie Cal is not one to give up that easily, and she threatens Ripley of revealing her location and tracking information to the military, and that was something that Ripley couldn't risk. Meanwhile, a Yaucha ship is seen closing in on the Typhoon. It's probable that the Yaucha inside was aware of the human xenomorph hybrid and intended to slay the abomination. Oh, and by the way, if you want to know more about such hybrids, check out our video titled 12 Exotically Deranged Hybrid Xenomorph Species. We'll leave a link in the description. Now, back to the video. So, Annalie Cow, Ripley, and the others were also approaching the Typhoon. They were going in disguised as food delivery service agents. Annalie's plan was to use the designated caterer's route to fight her way to the lab, and that is exactly what they did. But right at the lab's door, they found armed men who were, however, taken care of. The crew blows up the lab door to find Dr. Trollenberg inside, who fires at the crew. But Trollenberg also took several shots, which revealed that he was was in fact a Terminator. Trollenberg kills Saud and Echo from Cal's team, and would have killed Ripley had it not been for the Predator that we spoke about earlier. It decapitated Trollenberg. However, the crew couldn't figure out what it was because of the invisibility cloak, but they knew that it wasn't a Xenomorph. But right about then, someone throws a decloaked Predator into the room where the crew was present. Moments later, a super soldier came out. He was so huge and muscular that he dwarfed an almost 8 feet tall Predator. The comic ends with the super soldier soldier holding the predator's entire head in his palm. So what was this thing? Let's find out. Monster vs. Machine The crew watches in horror as the Terminator Xenomorph hybrid super soldier and the Yaucha battle each other. It seems that the super soldier was overpowering the Yaucha, but it shoots him with its plasma cannon. The cannon totaled the Trollenberg android, but he didn't even get phased, and walked right back up to the Yaucha. Interestingly, the android was able to absorb and leech elements from its own surroundings, almost like it was adept at adapting to battle conditions. This crazy ability to absorb metal to regenerate itself was something Something new to Annalie Cal as well, who was herself an android. The android was so powerful that he quite literally tore off one of the arms of the Predator and moved to the exterior bulkhead to absorb a portion of it. This left a hole in the vessel, and the air started guzzling out. While the others managed to escape, the Predator got sucked into the vacuum. The android then goes to Trollenberg's lab, where several facehuggers were being preserved. He would break through the glass cylinders to extract the facehuggers and put them in a canister similar to the one we saw at the beginning. It turned out that the android was extracting the spinal cord of the facehuggers and inserting them into a new host, possibly another android. But why was this dude working on creating another super soldier? Meanwhile, the crew made its way to their shuttle, Carthage, and Annalie Cal had brought along Trollenberg's decapitated head with herself. Just as they left the Typhoon aboard Carthage, they saw the space station explode behind them. Everyone was looking at Ripley for answers, and why not? I mean, she was the only one with a bunch of alien DNA inside her. But there was no way that she would know anything about our crab-faced monster. But she did know that the Xenomorph Terminator hybrid wasn't dead, or at least, she had a bad feeling about it. With Ripley not having any answers, Annalie took it upon herself to find one. Although Trollenberg and Annalie were both androids, she found that his wiring was both modern and antique at the same time. But she felt that there was enough in common with their system's construction to at least attempt a patch link with the operating system. If she could simply splice the cable wiring together in the right sequence, she would gain entry inside Trollenberg's head. And that's exactly what she did. As she had expected, Trollenberg's memory cache was protected with several layers of locks and encryptions. But something strange happened. She was confronted with a communication, more specifically, an interactive video message from John Connor from the Terminator movies. It was a shell program or a sleeper virus that hadn't originated from Trollenberg's operating system. In fact, it was supposed to present itself as a warning to anyone who attempted to infiltrate Skynet Terminator intelligence, and its sole purpose was to warn the infiltrator of the evil they were in contact with. Connor tells her that the recording was from the year 
1995, several hundred years before the events of the comic. But before Connor could tell her about the danger that Skynet technology posed, Annalee had to understand what Skynet was. So he briefs her about how the military came up with the technology in the late 20th century as a tool to maintain peace and stability in the world. However, the technology developed a mind of its own and started showing unprecedented and uncanny sociopathic tendencies. Skynet came to believe that the only path to a peaceful world was the indiscriminate and complete extinction of all life forms so that the machine rule could prevail, which would in turn create the perfect world order. The program went on to deploy armies and armadas of deadly machines, and the humans called these machines Terminators. Human beings teetered on the verge of extinction at the hands of Terminators until they eventually developed equally powerful and effective counter-Terminators. However, what the humans couldn't foresee was that Skynet program had started to see that its end could be near, and to counter that, it took a precautionary measure and created Crypto Terminators that were killer androids, carefully designed to pass as human beings. The Crypto Terminators were designed to survive hundreds of years until the right moment. The right moment being a point in time when humans have an enormous understanding of the physical world. And during their long wait, these androids would mimic human thoughts and habits and infiltrate the highest scientific research bodies to create a new generation of androids that would be deadlier than any force humanity has ever fought or will fight. But all of this leaves more questions than answers, right? So, Connor goes on to say, if this warning is received, it is because we of the 21st century have defeated Skynet in our time, and because the danger has survived in yours, for the sake of the human race, terminate Skynet. And while Connor was explaining all of this to Annalee, the panels described how Trollenberg had been in existence for a long time, and how he was hard at work creating the Terminator Xenomorph hybrid. In one of the panels, we get to see the hybrid Xenomorph-like head and razor-sharp teeth, while Trollenberg gives it human skin. Cal then logs out of Trollenberg's memories, and tells the crew that it might very well be a cover-up story, something to throw them off track, but that discussion would not come to a conclusion because the Carthage gets intercepted by the Yautja ships. Three Predators teleport aboard Carthage. One of the crew members, named Voorman, attacks one of the Predators, but he's no match for them. In the ensuing struggle, one of the Predators attacks Ripley and slits her wrists. Her acidic blood falls on the floor, and the Predators know what they have to do next. They took Ripley and teleported along with her. In fact, Annalee and others lose track of the Predator's ships as well. Meanwhile, the first hybrid super soldier reaches the Navy heavy ship called the Euphrates, and along with him is the new hybrid. Ripley the Predator. On the Carthage, Vorman suffered injuries at the hands of the Yochas, and Blades treated him. Meanwhile, Cal concludes that the Yochas probably knew the genetic make of Ripley, and that's why they abducted her instead of killing her. It was quite possible that they wanted Ripley for the same reasons as did the humans. Or maybe they needed her to assist in the fight against the hybrid super soldiers, because the Predators somehow knew the threat that these hybrids posed to the entire universe. But it was also possible that they somehow managed to tap into Connor's sleeper virus just as Cal did. Well, that's for the reader to answer. Nevertheless, Cal decides that they must use every last bit of information at their disposal to their advantage. Now, they had a two-pronged mission, saving Ripley and saving life as they knew it. Back on the Yocha ship, the Apex Hunters do not seem to care much about Ripley and just leave her on the teleportation pad as she watches them remove their bio helmets. In fact, they simply go about their business, which amuses Ripley. Why would they take all this trouble and kidnap her if she was so worthless? She wasn't even chained or anything, for crying out loud. But Ripley gave up feeling terror long back, and after all that the humans did to her in Alien Resurrection, anyone would. But the woman was curious, and she started to explore the Yocha ship. Eventually, she reaches the part of the ship where the Yochas kept their prized possessions and trophies, and realizes that the reason she got abducted was her DNA. One of the Predators approaches Ripley, and even though she had seen a lot of weird shit throughout her life, these hunters were little less than monsters to her. As the Predator came close, she recoiled in anger and punched the Predator. Clearly, it had little to no effect on him, but she did manage to infuriate the Predator. He carried her over on his broad shoulder before pinning her down on a circular operating table, and it wasn't before long that Terror found Ripley yet again, as she was knocked down by one of the Yochas and restrained. She is given a mask to facilitate her breathing, probably during the course of the operation that was to involve a thin needle drill. Meanwhile, Euphrates was about to see its worst, and last day. The men had reached the heavy cruiser, and were met by the commanding officer, who was pretty skeptical of two overgrown androids on his ship. 
If he had his way, he would simply throw them out in the vast nothingness of the empty space. Nevertheless, he learns that the super soldiers are demanding a transfer to something called the Black Asteroid, which was supposed to house a highly secure facility. He denies the request and waits for orders from higher up. When he goes to explain the delay in their transfer to the super soldiers, they do not take it too kindly. In fact, the two sociopathic androids get back on their pod and ram it deeper into the Euphrates. After this, they get off the pod and open fire on the personnel, killing everyone. Furthermore, the first super soldier once again absorbs metal from Euphrates' interior, which damages the ship's primary systems. So now we know what exactly happened to the Typhoon and why it exploded. Back on the Carthage, Annalee Cal deduces that the Yocha ship would take the same course as the super soldiers, which had to be a large bank of xenomorph genetic material, including several facehuggers. So in reality, Black Asteroid was nothing but a storehouse of xenomorphs, and the Terminators plan to find this cache to build the Skynet's hybrid army. Meanwhile, on the Yocha ship, Ripley has a nightmare in which she is swimming in a sea of xenomorphs. Just about then, she drowns, but goes in a free fall into space. A nude Ripley witnesses the endoskeleton of a traditional Terminator, but suddenly wakes up from the nightmare only to find more Yauchas staring down at her. It seems that they wanted her to follow, and follow she did. She is taken to what seems like a war council with a monitor displaying an image of an asteroid she has never visited or heard of, but somehow she remembers it. Somehow the Yauchas managed to take out the asteroid from her xenomorph genetic memory. Clearly, the asteroid was nothing but the black asteroid, and what Ripley was sensing was the presence of several xenomorphs inside the facility there. Meanwhile, the Euphrates Euphrates was given access to arrive at the Black Asteroid, but Super Terminators open fire on the station's control room, and once again they create a glorious mess along their path. But back on the Yaucha ship, something strange is going on. The ship is now lit with red lights, as if it was to symbolize a grand battle on the horizon. The pre-battle ritual starts, and the Yauchas cover her in their blood. Someone ran out of war paint. Furthermore, they give her a necklace made of xenomorph tooth, but Ripley's mind is somewhere else. She thinks about the deeper meaning behind all this, and tries to make sense of whatever was happening around her. She surmises that although the universe is filled with all kinds of monsters, the Yauchas are not one of them. Instead, they are only doing what they must do to survive and maintain a balance in the universe, at least as far as the Xenomorphs were concerned. But the arrival of the Terminator super soldiers into the equation was the means to a great imbalance in the natural order of things. They would otherwise make a trophy of her under usual circumstances, but because of the complexity of the present situation, they instead armed her and wanted her to fight as an ally. It was almost as if they respected her xenomorph side. But back on Black Asteroid, the Terminators found what they were looking for, an entire room filled with adult xenomorphs. The Final Strike The following day, the Navy had sent an entire armada, or maybe two, to hold siege on the asteroid and the facility on it. In the previous comic, the Terminators had activated several layers of defense mechanisms. It was necessary because the asteroid housed the most prized possession, but as we know, one man's defense mechanism is another android's offense mechanism. Invisible to the armada and the defense mechanism of the black asteroid, the Yaucha assault ship approached the asteroid stealthily. However, the ruthless Yauchas intentionally tripped the perimeter alarm and set off a chain reaction that ended with the total destruction of the fleet above. This in turn drained all the external power, which meant that all the defense systems were down, at least for a while. The Yaucha ship used the chaos to sweep in unchecked. Interestingly, Annalie Cal and her crew also used the opportunity to dock at the facility. Once inside, Ripley found herself lying near a Yaucha amidst a field of smoke. Right about then, one of the hybrids presented itself as it crouched over them. The hybrid was now in its true form. It had a muscular blue body, red eyes, clawed hands, fangs, and what can only be described as biomechanical veins running along its wrists and neck. The first two super soldiers had been hard at work and had managed to create a small army of super soldiers, and the manufacture of these humanoid abominations was only accelerating. The predators fought with all their might, but were being overpowered by the super soldiers, who were were superior to the Predators in terms of both might and cunning. When one of the Predators found itself in death's strong clutches, it activated its self-destruct device, only for the Super Soldier to wrap its body around the Predator to contain the impact of the blast. It was one sacrifice countered by another. Ripley had understood that the only way to give the Predators an upper hand against their fight was to trust her baser instincts of a Xenomorph. She crawled her way out of the battle scene, and found herself amidst numerous adult Xenomorphs in stasis. In order to even the odds, she un 
unleashed these biomechanical hounds of hell, and as she had hoped, the xenomorphs overpowered and outnumbered the super soldiers within no time. When one of the Yaucha blasted one of the xenomorphs, its acidic blood showered on a nearby super soldier, who was hurt so badly that even its absorption ability did not seem to work. The other Yauchas used the same tactic and started blowing off the xenomorphs to unleash acidic blood on the super soldiers. Not only were they killing xenomorphs, but also the abominations. But once the super soldiers had all been vanquished, the predators themselves became outnumbered by the xenomorphs. Amidst the carnage, Ripley saw that the first super soldier created by Trollingberg was trying to escape Black Asteroid, probably in the hope of starting it all over again. If this guy escaped, all would be undone, and all the death and destruction and the loss of life would be for nothing. So she decided to follow the monster, and as Connor had told Anna Lee Cal, it was all upon Ripley. She had to be the one to save all life. Around one of the corners, Ripley and Cal bumped into each other, and although Cal wanted Ripley to leave with her, the latter had to finish what she started. She had to destroy the last remaining super soldier as a means to bring some justice to the universe. And the last thing that Ripley tells Cal is, you did the right thing, bringing me back out into the black. I know that now. Please go. Let me do what I can do. Let me finish the job. Cal's colleague, Vorman, drags her away and back to their vessel, the Carthage. He had seen how Ripley was almost unfazed by the xenomorphs and how she was controlling them. Clearly, at least at that point of time, Cal was more human than Ripley. Cal makes one last attempt to save her friend, but Vorman forces her to sit down and they take off, somehow staying out of harm's way. Meanwhile, Ripley and the first super soldier boarded the same ship. She saw the hybrid at the controls, and it was a situation similar to the final events of Ridley Scott's Alien, in which Ripley was the one at the controls. When her plan of taking out the hybrid's eye with a predator knife failed, she switched to plan B. She immediately cut off her wrist and let the acidic blood drop on the controls, damaging them. And within no time, the flames from the destruction outside filled the escape pod, presumably killing both Ripley and the super soldier. Marvelous Verdict We feel that the comic did justice to the character of Ellen Ripley. Much like the movies, especially the first two movies, she was introduced to someone else's mess, but she ensures that she cleans it up real good. Despite being forced and blackmailed to go out there, she did not shy away from doing what was right. Hopefully, Ripley made her peace with her past and everything that she was subjected to by monsters of the same species as hers. And while she probably laid down her life, she saved mankind's soul. But more importantly, the comic the comic was well written and did justice to all the three franchises. We have read things where Batman fights aliens and predators, and he's only saved because of his uber strong plot armor, but that's not true for any of the characters in the comic. To sum it up, we would say, a job well done. And if you liked our content, don't forget to leave a like and subscribe to us if you haven't already. Have a good one and be safe. Thanks everyone.